thank you all for being here. I, logistically, I, I think I'm set. Um, let me see here. Let me start here. Okay, I'll explain the handouts here. Let me, let me get some logistics things out of the way. Um, I, I gave you two. One is the called the Book of Revelation Overview. What I did was I, I broke down the, the book kind of by chapters, and I'll explain it as we get into this. Um, I have it pretty much based on the, the feasts and the judgments, and I'll explain why I did that. It's, it simplifies the book. Revelation really is not that much of a difficult book when you understand the reason behind it or what, what's happening there. And then uh, the page after that is the Shemitah cycles. This was a, this was a page that I got from uh, Mark Biltz's uh, uh, heads up El Shaddai Ministries. And uh, uh, that was from his calendar that he sends out. It, it gives the Shemitah cycles and relates those to our calendar, uh, our Gregorian calendar. There you go. Two copies for you. And so that's what that is, and I'll explain that later. Um, and then the other handout I gave is, it says Revelation Notes. This is just a compilation. I didn't know exactly how to do this because there's so much information. How can I communicate this? So what I did, because people would uh, maybe want to use this as a reference, I put different information, bits of information in alphabetical order. So that's why those are, it's all alphabetical. There's, the way I present it and I'll, is not necessarily in that order, so I, I'll, I'll mention it to you as, as we go along as far as looking up these references. But I thought if, you're, if you might want something for a reference that you can look up later on down the line, well, well what's the situation with the covenants? How many, not, and these are not all the covenants that are out there. These are just a few, but these are, this was information that I have accumulated over the f last 15 years. Um, and I just, I just put it in there with the references to Scripture, so this might help you if you're doing some study on your own in the book of Revelation or something else. You may uh, use these as maybe a reference. I started, uh, <clears throat> what got me on this uh, st prophecy thing, started about 15 years ago, just to be upfront with you. Uh, Cindy and I were watching a TV show. We, we flipped a channel. We saw this prophetic teacher on the TV, and, and uh, we started listening to him, and he came from a Jewish perspective. Things he was sharing was from a Jewish perspective that I'd never, I'd never heard it before. And I thought, I mean, I've been a believer 50 years, and, and I thought, I've never heard this. What's this all about? So we tuned in and, and we started listening and we thought, wow, this is really amazing what he's sharing. And it was right out of the word. It was a brother in the Lord. And I, and I thought, this is, a, this is amazing. So we started, and I, I'm very skeptical. I'm a very skeptical person. So I, I thought, well, I'm going to check this out. So Cindy and I checked it out. We looked at some other commentators, uh, read some books. And, and as the Lord just started opening up our, our thinking to, well, what's this all about from a Jewish perspective? Where, where does this all fit in with prophecy? And things started really falling into place. And I thought, this really makes sense. It's very simple. And that was, to me, that was the key. It was simple. It wasn't complex, but it was very easy, very simple to understand. I thought, wow, this is amazing. So, uh, I thought, I got to put this together, some kind of notes, and that's why I came up with the notes uh, page uh, or handout. And I thought, I got to put this together, and maybe somewhere down the line I'll get a chance to share with other brothers or sisters about this. And, and I have, I've mentioned it to a few in the past, and, 
but I didn't really have much of anything organized. It was just kind of scattered thoughts. And I thought, well, I got to put this together in a more organized way. I, I'm Mr. Organization. That's me. I mean, I, and so I did. And I, I, I want to thank uh, Ray and Bill and, and the other brother Scott, the other brothers that, that uh, have supported me and asked me to, to teach on this because uh, this, is, this is exciting. I think it's exciting anyhow. But uh, I'm going to read a lot out of the Word. And uh, if you want to follow along, that's great. Uh, so I just thought I'd mention that to you. Uh, I guess I'll start <clears throat> with an in introduction. Uh, I think we are in the last days, last times right now. Um, and I wanted to point out examples. If you look in, uh, in the section that's called Corruption Violence on your handout, there's some scriptures there that I was going to read from. In Luke... Luke 17, 26 to 30 says, Just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying. They were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. And it was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. So I look back in Genesis and I thought, well, what are some of the things that were happening during, the, during those days of Noah? And in Genesis 6, 11 through 13, now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked on the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I'm about to destroy them with the earth. So the thing I think about is, is violence, you see, in our world today, in our country, our country. I mean, you can't pick up the newspaper without seeing some violence and corruption somewhere. In Habakkuk, <clears throat> say one thing for sure, I've, I've learned where books are in the Minor Prophets, <laughs> which I wasn't real strong on before. Okay, Habakkuk 1, 1 to 4. Just think about this, what we see today. The oracle which Habakkuk the prophet saw, How long, O Lord, will I call for help? And you will not hear. I cry out to you, violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention rises. Verse 4 is really, I think, is what's happening today. Therefore, the law is ignored, and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. I think, wow. I mean, of course, it was true in Habakkuk's day, and I think it's true today that we see this happening around us. In the last verse is Ecclesiastes 8.11. <clears throat> He says, because the sentence against evil and evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. So you see that happening in the world today. We see uh, <clears throat> another thing <clears throat> in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, 7. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, for nation will rise against nation. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is going 
south, and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. So we see that happening, and uh, <clears throat> actually I have a front headline from Fox News printed out yesterday. Don't know how many of you know this, but in Morocco two days ago, there was an earthquake, huge earthquake, that killed a thousand people at least. So, <clears throat> and some people might say, well, you know, there are earthquakes all over the place anyhow, but, but if you look at the timeline, I mean, many commentators have put the, these out on the web. I'm sure you could probably look for yourselves that earthquakes have, have skyrocketed in the last five or 10 years, not only in intensity, but frequency. So, <clears throat> I, <clears throat> one other thing is um, <clears throat> that I've seen is we're moving toward a one world government. So this is another issue that we're facing. In the handout, if you look under governmental controls in the last days, <clears throat> These are things that the government, we, we're starting to see these things occur more and more frequency, frequently, I'm sorry, in the, in the realm of education. We see in the news where parental rights are being attacked by the government. We see f food as an issue that government will, government will control. As an example, I have a neighbor who's from Netherlands and uh, he's a believer, he's a missionary. He and his wife live nearby. And he is really concerned about Netherlands because that country was the breadbasket of Europe, pretty much the breadbasket. And they have banned, the government is banning the use of nitrate for fertilizers. And the farmers, I, many of you may have seen on the news, but over the last few months, farmers have gone on strike. They've, they've uh, uh, complained to the government that they're, they can't get the fertilizer to grow their crops. And as a result, people are can't produce, the farmers can't produce the crops that they have in the past. So, so Nether, the Netherlands is going down with regard to being the breadbasket of, of Europe. So food is an issue that government might control. Uh, another thing is uh, Ireland. I don't know if you've, oh, well, thank you. I don't know if you've not, uh, seen in the news, but uh, in Ireland, they are, uh, the government is buying, I think they said something like 4,000 cattle from farmers and just slaughtering them because they, they're concerned about global warming, climate change, because the, the cows supposedly are, with their flatulence, have, emit methane. So this is bad news for the climate. So Ireland is, the government is demanding these cattle be turned over and just slaughtered needlessly. The third thing is information. We see the news media uh, frequently coordinating with government to stifle uh, particular issues. Religion, for example, uh, in India, uh, the president of India is um, trying to make that whole country uh, entirely Hindu. And they're expelling Christians, they're, they're expelling Muslims, or that, or killing them, or persecuting them. So we see the government is starting to control religion. Uh, they control health care. Uh, I know our country is moving toward a one, one system, one uh, entity, provider for health care, military, and of course money, wealth. The government can, is moving toward cryptocurrency. That's the latest thing. So uh, you can see how that's going to affect controls. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so now moving on to the next area is why read Revelation? Okay, why, why, why even read it? Okay, number, number one, it's uh, we, we're blessed. If you look at Revelation 1.3, it says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in the, for the time is near. So we're blessed if we read Revelation. <clears throat> Number two, 
It's about Messiah. And if you look in your notes, you'll see under the word Messiah, I have different places in the book of Revelation where Messiah appears. <clears throat> if you look in uh, Revelation 1, verses 12 through 18, He's the judge. It says, And I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his breath, breast with a golden girdle. And his head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet were like burnished bronze when it has been caused to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. So here he's the judge. He, uh, it's interesting, his feet... Um, it says his feet are, are, are like burnished bronze. Well, bronze, if you look in metals, it, this is also in your notes, under metals, there are diff different metals have different symbols, and bronze is a picture of judgment. So uh, in chapter 2, we can look where the Lord or the Messiah is a prophet. In chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich and the blasphemy by those who say they're Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. So he's looking in the future here. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. So, so there he's pro prophesying about what's going to happen to them in the future. Then in verse, or chapter 4, verse 11, he's the creator. So we see he's the creator. Worthy art thou, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast uh, create, uh, created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. He's the kinsman redeemer in Revelation 5, 9. <clears throat> it says, and they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. We see he was the priest. He's a priest. If you go to Revelation 8, 3 through 5. And another angel came and stood at the altar. Now to stand at the altar, you had to be a priest. Holding a golden censer and much increase was given, or incense was given to him that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And then it says, And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand, and the angel <clears throat> took the censer and he filled it with the fire of the altar and threw it to the earth, and there followed peals of thunder and sounds of, and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. Then he's the Lord of the earth. If you look at Revelation 10, verses 1 and 2. And I saw another strong angel coming out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head. So you see the rainbow upon his head with the covenant of the rainbow. And his face was like the sun and his feet like pillars of fire. And he laid, and he had in his hand a little book which was open, and he placed his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. So by having his foot on the sea and his foot on the land, it shows he's dominant, he's, he's controlling both. He's Lord. He's the Lord of the sea and the land, or Lord of the earth. Then uh, in chapter 14, if you, <clears throat> he's, he's the son of man, the reaper with the sickle. 
chapter 14, verse 14, and I looked and behold a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. <clears throat> and another angel came out of the temple crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap because the hour to reap has come because the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was reaped. And last, we see he's the king of kings and lord of lords. <clears throat> Chapter 19, 11 to 16. And he, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat upon it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. And his eyes are like a flame of fire, and upon his head are many diadems. And he has a name written upon, it, upon him, which no one knows except himself. And he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may smite the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron." And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. So we want to read Revelation because we're going to be blessed. We're going to read Revelation because it's about Messiah, like we've just looked at the, where he appears in, in the book. And we're going to read about the completeness because Revelation completes, completes the New Testament. And if you look on your list, uh, on your notes, under Numbers, <clears throat> I wanted to bring this out. Numbers are important in Scripture. And I've listed some of the numbers <clears throat> to give you an idea of what they represent in Scripture. If we look at <clears throat> number seven, Seven indi indicates completeness, or a complete natural cycle, perfection, or totality. It also can refer to Shemitah. So, we read about the completeness of the scriptures with Revelation. Also in Numbers, the number seven, which indicates completeness. You can see the number, see the references to seven. We have seven angels, seven assemblies or churches, seven diadems, seven eyes, seven golden bowls, seven golden lampstands, seven heads, seven horns, seven kings, seven lamps of fire, seven mountains, seven peals of thunder, seven plagues, seven seals, seven spirits, seven stars, 7,000 people killed, and seven trumpets. So you see seven is predominant in the book of Revelation, indicating completeness. So that's Probably the third reason why we want to read Revelation, it completes the New Testament, completes the scriptures. So to aid our study, I've also, uh, here's some other inf information for you. There, uh, when you look at different commentators or uh, read different books, they all have different interpretations of, of Revelation. Uh, there are many, many out there. Uh, I just want to say that I'm coming from the fut what they call the futurist point of view. I believe Revelation is coming in the future. Uh, so there are some people who think it's already started, and it's, some people even think it's almost past. But I, I hold to the futurist. I think Revelation is coming. Tribulation is coming. We haven't gotten there yet, but we're getting there. wanted to share a couple of verses that are... I think, instrumental in, in our study out of Ecclesiastes. I think these are really helpful. In Ecclesiastes 1, verse 9, it says, That which has been is that which will be, and that which has been done is that which will be done. So there's nothing new under the sun. In chapter 3, verse 15 also, 
that which is has already been, and that which will be has already been, for God seeks what has passed by. So I think those, <clears throat> those verses are key because they, they talk about the cycle, cycles of history. And, and Scripture uh, <clears throat> from these verses refers to like the Old Testament. Oftentimes you see pictures in the Old Testament, but it's coming to pass in the New Testament. So I think those verses are really instrumental in, in, um, in understanding what, we're, what we read in Revelation because what, what we see in Revelation has already happened in the Old Testament, essentially, in, as pictures or types. Also, uh, if you look at Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 through 10, Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. So <clears throat> what we see in in Scripture is Genesis, what happens in Genesis and Revelation, since they're kind of the bookends of the Scriptures, we see the flow of events, of the flow of events of Genesis being exactly what's happening in Revelation, only just reversed. So you see in Genesis, you see it starts with eternity. Revelation, it ends with eternity. In Genesis, we see sin, death, the sun and moon creation coming into existence. In Revelation, we see them all disappearing, sin being go, uh, going away, death going away. No need for the sun and the moon as we start getting toward the end of Revelation. There's no need for the sun and the moon because the Lord is the light. He's our radiance. So you see the, the bookends of the scripture, they're they're opposite. <clears throat> if you look uh, in Revelation 1.19, overall, in, <clears throat> in looking at the um, kind of understanding somewhat of what's going on, Revelation 1.19, it kind of gives a little bit of a overall sections of the book. Write, therefore, the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall take place after these things. So as I've looked at these things, he says, write the things which you have seen. My understanding and, and from my, my studies is he's talking about chapters one through three. Those are the things he's seen, essentially, one through three. The things which are, or I'm sorry, things which you have seen, I think would be chapter one, the things which are, are two and three. I'm sorry, two and three. The things which are, which is the church. He's currently alive during the church age, so it's the church. And the things which shall take place after these things, that would be chapters four to the end of, end of the book. So that kind of gives you a little bit of an overview. Uh, and as I put on my handout where it says the overview, uh, chapters uh, 1, 2, and 3 are pretty much geared for the church. It's, it's the church age, uh, and that ends at the end of chapter 3. <clears throat> so to keep things simple, my, my main focus on the Revelation overview that I handed out to you is the feasts of Israel and the 21 judgments with the other information listed as subcategories. And then keep in mind as we read where it talks about the word angel, 
the word angel means a messenger. And it may be a person, like I've mentioned about Messiah in chapters 10 and 14. Angel is just a messenger. And it can refer to a person. If you look at chapter 19, verse 10, and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And then if you look at chapter 22, verse 9, and he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who heed the words of this book, worship God. So John was going to fall down at the angel's feet, and he said, don't do that. You know, I'm just, I'm a fellow servant of yours. So he, so he wasn't, even though he said they were angels, an angel can be a person in the book of Revelation. And there's a couple of examples of it, besides, like I said, being Messiah. And then um, during our studies, uh, some commentators uh, think that the angels, which is kind of interesting, the angels in the Old Testament dealing with the judgments are actually prophets that lived. Amos, Hosea, Joel. And the judgments that they're pouring out are judgments that the Old Testament prophets themselves poured out. Or, or oversaw or prophesied about in the Old Testament. Some commentators think that. So, uh, could be valid. I'm, I, I don't know. I can't, personally can't necessarily say that that's always the case, but it could be. It's very possible that that's the case. <clears throat> okay, moving on to my next section here in my study is, and this is, I think, maybe is the main part, is what's the key purpose of the book? Um, and the key purpose, as I see it, is redemption. All right, there are two, actually. Redemption and the fulfillment of the seven feasts of Israel. When I talk about redemption, and uh, you can look on your notes, I have it under the word uh, redemptions. It's to take back the title to the earth and complete the redemption of Israel and all believers. That's the redemption process. And number two is the fulfillment of the seven feasts of Israel. Now, so, to some of you, this may be all brand new. Believe me, I, it was new to me when I started thinking about these things. So, let's look at redemptions. <clears throat> our soul and our spirit were lost. If you look at Genesis 2, 16 and 17... And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you shall surely die. And chapter 3, 17. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it, Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. So mankind lost his soul and his spirit, essentially. They died. So we became lost because of sin. Okay, so let's look at redeemed. So here's the first redemption. Of course, the New Testament with Jesus talks about this, but look, look at Revelation specifically. 
chapter 1, verse 5, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. So, so he's redeeming our souls, our spirits, back to him. In chapter 5, verse 9, they sang a new song, saying, Worthy art thou to take the book, to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So that's where our souls and our bodies, that's the first redemption because we died. So he's redeeming us back. Our bodies, what's the next thing to be redeemed? It's our bodies. That's what Revelation talks about. How did we, how did we lose our, our bodies? Well, they died, essentially. Uh, we suffered death. <clears throat> Genesis 3, 19. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground because from it you were taken for your dust and to dust you shall return. So our bodies decay. They go down. They, they died. So if you look at chapter 20, verses 4 to 5, where we, we are redeemed, our bodies are redeemed. He said, And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark of their forehead and upon their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So they were resurrected, came to life. So their bodies came back to life. So there's a picture of the bodies being, our bodies being redeemed. The third redemption and I, is the earth. And I think many people in our, Cindy's and my studies over this, a lot of commentators miss this. The earth is redeemed. Where was the earth lost? <clears throat> Let's go back to Genesis 3, 17 to 19. And I don't say this meaning the earth is floating around somewhere lost. That's not quite what I mean. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken for your dust and to dust you shall return. Okay, so how is the earth redeemed? Let's go to look at Revelation 10. Verses 1 and 2. I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head. This is Messiah. And his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book or scroll, which was open. And he placed his right foot on the sea and his left on the land. So he had the scroll in his hand. That's, that's important. We'll look at that. It goes back to earlier in Revelation about the scroll in his hand. Verses 7 to, <clears throat> to 10 it says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished, as he preached to his servants, the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me and saying, Go take the book or scroll which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. And I, John, went to the angel telling him to give me the little book and he said to me, take it and eat it. 
and it will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And then we go to Revelation 11, 15. He says, and, in, and the seventh angel sounded and there arose loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. So it ties it together. So in the, when the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, that finished the mystery. What's the mystery? The title to the earth is taken back from Satan. That's the, that's the third redemption. I'll be honest with you, most commentators don't pick up on that. But that completes redemption. Our souls, our spirits, our bodies, and the earth. They're all redeemed. That completes it. Revelation completes the redemption. I, I think it's exciting. I, I, I do. I, I, I can't com communicate my excitement about it, but I think it's exciting anyhow. You may agree with me or not, but, uh, but this is the way I, I see it. I want to share this with you so you'd be equipped. That's my goal. Let's look at, uh, on the, in that same area, Satan rules the inhabited earth or world. Let's look at Luke. How, how do we know that the earth needs redeeming? Well, let's look, let's look at Luke 4, 5 to 7. Here, here's evidence. Because obviously the Lord is Lord of all. He, he controls the universe, obviously. <clears throat> Luke 4, 5 to 7 as I started thinking about this, how this all tied in together, I thought, well, this explains why Satan tempted the Lord, when you think about it, or, or not why, but part of it. He led me up, I'm sorry, and he led him up, meaning Jesus, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and in a moment of time. And the devil said to Jesus, I will give you all this domain and its glory for it has been handed over to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. <laughs> wow. I, I mean, that was an eye opener. I thought, well, there it is. Satan had possession of the earth. We lost it back at the Garden of Eden. We should have had it, but because of sin, we lost it. Satan took control of the earth. In John 12, 31. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world shall be cast out. So here, John said, the ruler of the world. Well, who's the ruler? It's Satan. So here's another verse that Satan is controlling the world. John 14, 30. I will not speak much more with you for the ruler of the world is coming and he has nothing in me. And the last verse, Ephesians 2, like Dan shared today, we fight against spiritual forces in the heavenlies. Boy, that's for sure. <clears throat> Ephesians 2. 1 to 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So you see, Satan has control of the earth. He has control of the air. I mean, if you think about the news media, I mean, 
a lot of the evil that goes on, you think, wow, you know, we are in a spiritual warfare. No question about it. So here Satan rules the inhabited earth and has control. So the, the redemption of the earth is where Jesus is taking it back. And this is, this is where, the, the, where it talks about the scroll in chapters 5, 6, and 8. That scroll is the title to the earth. And like we looked at, it, Jesus is taking it back. That's the mystery of the seventh angel that blew the trumpet. That's the mystery being completed. And that's the earth is now back. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and Christ. Wow, that's, that's so exciting. Anyhow, okay. Um, the next section I had down underneath on your, on your notes was the right of redemption of property. <clears throat> I'm running out of time here. Back in Leviticus 25... I'll try to get this going here. This deals with the redemption of the earth. <clears throat> Verses 23 to 28. The land, moreover, shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine. The Lord's talking about that. For you are but aliens and sojourners with... Did I read that right? With me, that's right, okay. Thus, for every piece of, of your property, you are to provide for the redemption of the land. If a fellow countryman of yours becomes so poor he has to sell part of his property, then his nearest kinsman is to come and buy back what his relative has sold. Or in the case of a man, or in case a man has no kinsman, but so recovers his means so as to find sufficient for its redemption, then he shall calculate the years since its sale and refund the balance to the man to whom he sold it, and so return to his property. But if he has not found sufficient means to get it back for himself, then what he has sold shall remain in the hands of its purchaser until the year of Jubilee. But at the Jubilee it shall revert that he may return to his property." So I'm not going to get into the year of Jubilee. It's when property was returned back to the former owner. It happened every 50 years. I'm, I'm just not going to cover that, but you can research that on your own. But, but that's talking about property, redeeming property. And the last thing I was going to mention here is sealing of a deed. It's interesting, Revelation 6 with the deed to the earth. If you go back to Jeremiah 32... It talks about the exact picture of what Revelation 5, 6, and 8 is all about. It's, it's kind of cool about the, the sealed deed. Helps if I get the right page here. 32, 6 to 14. This is kind of exciting because when you think about the Old Testament being a picture of what happens in the New Testament, you can see how the seven sealed scroll with the title of the earth. Here it's a picture in Jeremiah of a deed. Makes sense. Verses 6 to 14. And Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Behold, Hananel, the son of Shalom, your uncle, is coming to you, saying, Buy for yourself a field, my field, which is at Anathoth, for you have the right of redemption to buy it. Then Hanamel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the guard, according to the word of the Lord, and said to me, Buy my field, please, that is at Anathoth, which is in the land of Benjamin. For you have the right of possession, and the redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field, which was in Anathoth, from Hanamel, my uncle's son, and I weighed out the silver for him, 17 shekels of silver. And I signed and sealed the deed and called in witness. And it's interesting, signed and sealed it. Called in witnesses and weighed out the silver on the scales. Then I took the deed of deeds of purchase, both the sealed copy containing the terms and conditions 
and the open copy. So you have two copies. And I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, the son of Neriah, the son of, how do you pronounce it, Messiah, in the sight of Hananel, or Hanamel, my uncle's son, and in the sight of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase before all the Jews who were sitting in the court of the guard. And I commanded Baruch in their presence, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these deeds, these sealed, this sealed deed of purchase, and this open deed, and put them in an earthenware jar that they may last a long time. And then verse 44, Men shall buy fields for money, sign and seal deeds, and call in witnesses in the land of Benjamin, in the environs of Jerusalem, in the cities of Judah, in the cities of the hill country, in the cities of the lowland, and in the cities of the Negev, for I will restore their fortunes, declares the Lord. So that completes the redemptions. Um, <clears throat> So you can see the, the deed is, is a picture there in, in Jeremiah. I'm running out of time. But anyhow, the next, the next key purpose of the book of Revelation, besides the redemption, is to complete the seven feasts of Israel. And if you go to the feasts, it, it's in your notes, if you look at feasts, There are seven feasts in Israel, and this was an eye-opener to Cindy and me. We had never thought of this before at all, and I'm going to run out of time here before I get through all of this. There are seven feasts of Israel that are still kept today. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, feast of weeks. Those are the four spring feasts. Those have all been literally fulfilled in Messiah, all four. They're celebrated by the Jews today. Nobody talks about the fall feast necessarily being prophetic, but there are, there are three fall feasts, trumpets, day of atonement, and feast of booze. These are all in the future. And from my study, I find that Revelation completes those three fall feasts. We see all three in the book of Revelation. We see trumpets, we see Day of Atonement, which is Yom Kippur, and we see Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. All three are complete in the book of Revelation. They're all three are there. Now, if you, <clears throat> I won't necessarily go into the spring feasts. I mean, we, you know the Passover is a picture of Messiah's death. Unleavened bread is a picture of his burial. First fruits is a picture of Messiah's resurrection. Feast of Weeks is Pentecost. Shavuot, that was the birth of the church. We're currently in the church age. Uh, the church age, come, in my understanding, comes to an end at the end of Revelation chapter 3. You'd never see the church mentioned in Revelation after chapter 3. That's the end of the church age. That starts, chapter 4, verse 1, starts the fall feast, trumpets. Trumpets is called Yom Teruah or Rosh Hashanah. In fact, it starts next week. In case you didn't know that. Um, it's the rapture of the church. It's the wedding of Messiah. And it starts the ten, what they call the ten days of awe in, in Jewish teachings. Ten days of awe, you have two days for Feast of Trumpets. You have seven days for the tri prophetically for the tribulation. And then you have one day for a day of atonement. So there are your ten days of awe. Two days for trumpets, seven for tribulation, and uh, one day for the, for the Day of Atonement. And next week, Tishri 1 starts the new year for the Jew Jewish New Year. So uh, that's the start of the new year is the Feast of Trumpets. Then you have Day of Atonement, which is Yom Kippur, or Messiah's return to the Mount of Olives, prophetically. 
It's a picture of the grape harvest. The grapes are, are, are uh, reaped in the fall. You have the barley harvest in the spring, wheat harvest in the summer, grape harvest in the fall. So the grapes you often see in Revelation talks about the grapes. People talk about the grapes of wrath. Well, you know, that's because the grape harvest is in the fall. And then we have the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, which is Sukkot or Messiah's reign or the 1000 millennium reign of Christ on earth. So those are the seven feasts. I'm out of time. I don't want to keep you. But those are the seven feasts. I'll just end it right there. <clears throat> so those are the the two main reasons when you, when you think about revelation, if you think about the redemptions and you think about completing the, the, the fall feasts, it simplifies the book of revelation. It, it does. It, and, and the reason of, for the judgments, the 21 judgments are to, are to redeem the earth. And we'll, we'll talk about that some more. But that's kind of an overview. Uh, at least for, I've covered my, my main points up to this point. Does anybody have any thoughts or questions? I know we, we're not quite through it all yet, and I'll cover f- some more of the feasts as we go on. Anybody have any thoughts or questions? Or I'll, I'll try to answer it. What? The nations, I haven't covered that yet. The second handout, I just have a reference question. Um, speaks of Meshach as Turkey, Lud as Turkey, Gomer as Turkey, and a couple of Jordan and a couple of Saudi Arabia. Are, are these cities in the nations? Or are these separate nations? Good question. There's sections. If you look at if you look at the Old Testament map, Meshach, uh, Meshach, uh, Lud, uh, they're all sections of Turkey. If you look, if you go back on a map on the Old Testament, you'll see some of the, you'll see where people uh, with these names settled in the in the in modern day. What I try to do on the nations is make modern day names for these biblical biblical areas. That, that's what I tried to do for so you. these different names would be different sections of that same country. Like, yes, I, I guess that would answer your question, yes. So... Pegrat's Jordan. They're different sections of Jordan. When it refers to the biblical Hagrites, that, that, that section, when it talks about the Hagrites, that's Jordan. They, they lived in Jordan. Uh, the Ishmaelites are, are considered Saudi Arabia when you look at it from the historical perspective. Right, but then there's Sheba too, is Saudi Arabia. Yes, that's correct. So, so right, yeah. It, good point. Sections of the same nation. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, that, that's a good, good question. I, if you have any questions, that's, that's fine. Very good question. I tried to make this as simple as I could. I, so if, you, if something is confusing, just holler at me. Wow. Okay. Okay. Just, I mean, just, just I can. Because you had mentioned to me that you, well, you okay. earlier on that you, it started, the whole thing started with um, the presentation that you heard. From, right. Uh, and I know that, I don't know if you ever read Clarence Larkin, um, who wrote about the book of Revelation. I have not. This, this is complicated. <laughs> okay. But,
I can come up with a list of different people. I mean, we've read different books. Uh, we've listened to different commentators, look at videos. I, I can come up with a list. There's probably about a dozen or thereabouts of people that we've read their, their information. Uh, I don't have a list off the top of my head, but I can, I can come up with something if you'd like. Sure, be happy to do that. I mean, we've accumulated this over 15 years. Yeah. So it's, and some of the people have gone to be with the Lord. Right. So. Okay. Sure. Be happy to. Any, anybody else? Otherwise, we're done, I think. I, I don't want to keep you beyond my promised time. I want to keep my promise. Any other thoughts? We'll continue on with the, with the next... Uh, area, then my next main point. I hope I've challenged you. I really do challenge your thinking because when I started thinking about this, I was challenged. I'll be honest, Cindy and I are skeptical and, and we really started thinking about this and started diving into some of this and I thought, wow, I've never heard this before in my life. I was in I was a believer at that point, 35 years in the Lord, and, I, and I've never heard of it. And I was challenged, and I thought, wow, but I've got to pass this on to the saints. So anyhow, that's it, and we'll go for next week. Next week, I, if something comes up, I have everybody's email address. I'll shoot an email to you if something comes up. Otherwise, we'll go again next week if that's okay. Does that work?